Welcome to the first episode of the Product Design Report, a show about what's going on in the product design world and why it matters. My name is Jordan Bowman, and I'm here with Taylor Palmer, and we're the creators of UX Tools. Let's get into our first segment, Hot Topic. Uh, in Hot Topic, we highlight a recent take on a specific subject in the industry. Um, one that we're thinking about today is about hiring, specifically kind of the state of the industry right now in regards to remote work. We found this really interesting article put out by CNBC called The Most In-Demand Work From Anywhere Jobs Companies Are Hiring For. Uh, so this is specifically about not just remote work, but like work from anywhere. You might've heard the term digital nomads of, you know, people who are like traveling through, you know, Europe and South America or whatever, while they're still finding Wi-Fi and, and doing their product design job. And interestingly, uh, in this article, product design, graphic design, web design, these all show up really high on the list of jobs that these work from anywhere, uh, kind of remote first companies are hiring for. Yeah, I think they're first. I think they're first on the list, product design is. Yeah, so product designers, I guess, if, if you're really into remote work, um, or specifically if you're wanting to live that digital nomad life, this is good news for you. So I've been working remote since before 2020. Um, it's kind of funny, actually, because a lot of times, like before 2020, I would, I would tell people that I'm working remotely, and they'd be like, so you don't actually work. <laughs> but now everyone kind of gets it, right? Uh, I've been working remotely as a product designer specifically since for, you know, several years before 2020 happened. And there's a lot of debate in the industry about whether or not that actually works. But, you know, in in my experience and opinion, I think it really does work depending on your team. Obviously, there's a lot of team dynamics that need to come into play and kind of synergize. Like you need to be working with developers who are also really good at remote, at remote work. But... Um, I, I think there's pros and cons. And for me personally, I think that a lot of the pros of working remotely um, outweigh the cons. Yeah, one thing I can say for sure is that uh, the, the industry will be forced to change. Like this data point, as well as many others, such as your experience, are showing that whether or not remote work is the best way to do product design, it's happening. And so tools and teams and processes are going to change to embrace that. Uh, my, my personal experience as well has been um, that product design works a lot better on companies with companies that are remote first. Um, and so they're, they're using the tools and, and, and they're set up to do frequent asynchronous communication and they know and they know how to collaborate in that way. So it'll be interesting to see where the industry goes. But right now, as far as we're seeing, product design is really hot in the remote space. So now on to our main topic for today. We're going to talk about PenPot. And Taylor recently made a video about this, so I'll let him explain a bit about what PenPot actually is. Yeah, if you haven't seen it yet, you should check out our designer's toolkit video about Figma alternatives. Um, but essentially, PenPot is building the open source alternative to tools like Figma and Sketch. Uh, the reason that's interesting is because open source tools are usually free. Uh, teams can also take open source tools kind of branch that code and start to create really interesting things on top of it. Um, as, as PinPot continues to grow, we should see a really interesting tool ecosystem develop around it, and uh, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, so the reason we wanted to talk about PinPot today is that they recently announced that they just got a big investment of cash. They got a bunch of funding. Um, and in this article that explains about the Series A funding they just received, which we'll link to in the show notes, they said um, interest, a couple interesting things. So first of all, the former COO of Figma is one of the angel investors, which is pretty cool. Um, they, they've implied that they're seeing a lot of signups. I mean, um, quite an influx of new users. They're working on auto layout and advanced components and being able to import files from Figma, which is something that they've had on the docket for quite a long time. But, you know, especially with funding, they're able to work more on these features that people are asking for. And what I think is interesting is that the CEO of PenPot, I heard him say recently that they're trying to make PenPot into um, one central place where designers and developers can work on stuff together. So, I mean, Figma obviously has worked really hard on that. 
you know, with the code integration and everything like that. But PenPod is focused a little bit more on that. Um, so I, I think PenPod is just in a in this really interesting um, situation and sort of launch pad right now with uh, all these new users and people kind of looking for a Figma alternatives and stuff and the fact that it's open source and free and now they have funding to help them come up with new features. I just think it's, they're in a really interesting position. It must be really fun to work at PenPot right now. Like it, it really feels like the stars are aligning for them uh, after Adobe acquired Figma and, and now they're getting this funding. Like um, I'm sure I'm sure they're just having a blast and, and building like crazy. Uh, but it also just goes to show you how volatile the tools industry really is, right? Because um, we, we've seen from our data from the design tool survey that it only took Figma a few years to really overtake the, the design world. Um, and, and, and here we see that like there are still many other players in the game um, making pretty serious strides. I mean, $8 million is, is, uh, is a pretty great Series A. So it's, I'm, I'm excited to see where they'll take that. Yeah, I am too. And I think it's worth uh, really understanding that and kind of accepting it as a product designer. The fact that our industry and our, our tools evolve quite a lot. Um, it, is, it is really interesting to me that, you know, Figma is obviously the main player right now. It's almost all anyone talks about, but literally two and a half or so years before is the point where it overtook Sketch. So our industry moves extremely quickly, and uh, I think it's worth being a, a little more flexible as product designers so that you can kind of embrace that change. Um, for example, I think it's worth just kind of taking a look at PenPod and seeing what they have. Maybe it doesn't work for you right now, but I think it's worth taking a look at at least. Yeah, a couple, a couple of truths I think we hold on to here at UX Tools are that like really it's about skills, not about tools. So if if you if you understand the fundamentals and principles of of user centered design and UI design, you can do that in just about any tool. You might feel a little bit slower or or feel like you know not everything's quite going as fast as you want it to. Um, but as as long as you're able to, um, as long as you're able to produce the outcomes that you're looking for the tool doesn't really matter. As long as it works well for your team, it, it, it allows you to collaborate in the ways you want to and you can create the things you want to. Tools will, tools will come and go. Um, you know, we'll see a lot more of them in the future pop up, I'm sure. And, uh, and, and so PinPot should definitely throw their hat in the ring and keep, keep playing the game. You know? and, and hopefully that competition serves us well as designers because we see these companies have to compete and continue to innovate and make really cool stuff. So let's get into our next segment called Extra Credit, where we talk about relevant topics outside the world of product design. So the other night, my wife and I were looking through Netflix, scrolling and trying to figure out what we were going to watch. And we found this show called Abstract. It's kind of been out for a while, but we neither of us have watched it. She's a graphic designer, so she's interested in design too. And this show is essentially um, about you know specific designers of all types and kind of how they do their work. So there's graphic designers, there's industrial designers, there's interior designers. And the one that we watched was an interior designer named Ilsa Crawford. She's an interior designer. And I thought that the episode was just totally fascinating and had a lot of application to product designers. So for example, she does a ton of basically user research with her clients. Like she'll go and She'll do a, a bunch of research with the client themselves, and then she'll go and, you know, whoever the building is for that she's designing for, she'll go and talk to users, do interviews, and make sure that she totally understands where they're coming from so that she can design to fit their needs, their jobs to be done, kind of, which is what we, we try to do in product, desi product design, too. Um, another thing she does that I really like is that she tries to engage all the senses, like all five of your senses, in whatever interior space she's designing. And she likes to promote well-being via her design. So like happiness and health. Um, so I just thought that was really interesting. I, you know, I, I watched that series um, a couple years ago as well and, and really enjoyed a lot of the episodes I watched. I'm sure I missed a few along the way. I would really encourage um, 
product designers who might be watching to check it out because I think we can learn so much from other industries, especially industries that have been around a lot longer than ours has, right? Like we're, we, we're a relatively young industry, all things considered. Um, and I, I specifically remember one, the head of design at Fiat Chrysler, I believe it is, who was designing their newest minivan, which by the way, helped me eventually come to terms with buying a minivan because I'm a designer dad and that was something that I had to do. But you want to talk about like prototyping, you know, we, we like to post pictures online of like all the arrows we connected for our prototypes in Figma or whatever and show this big mess of like spaghetti noodles. Like imagine prototyping an entire vehicle and having to create that and having to scrap it and start over from square one and do it again. Like there's some serious testing and research that goes on um, and, I, and I think you can draw a lot of parallels to the work we do on a smaller, much faster scale in, in product design. Uh, but I, I also really enjoy learning from and seeing many of those other extremely talented designers. Uh, another one that comes to mind is Jonathan Heffler, the typeface designer. I've, I've followed him for a long time. Um, so yeah, hi, highly recommended. Yeah, and I think the takeaway for me here is, obviously, it's really it's just fascinating to learn about these other related fields that aren't actually your own field. But also, like you mentioned before, we have, I think we have a lot to learn from these other fields. I mean, graphic design, for example, is literally thousands of years old. And interior design is hundreds, if not thousands of years old. So there's a lot to be learned about the design process and how to make a successful design from these other industries. So if you haven't checked out Abstract on Netflix, we definitely recommend it. Next up, Have You Heard, where we cover product announcements and new releases. Today we'll be talking about Stark for Mac. Stark has been around for a little while, but they recently released their Mac tool for Mac OS. Yeah, so there's a designer I follow called Anna Cook on Twitter. Um, she's a, a specialist in accessibility. She said recently, and we'll link to this tweet, it's not reasonable to expect all designers to be experts in accessibility in the same way that we can't expect all designers to be experts in design systems or data visuals. We need all designers to know the basics and we need specialists to fill in the gaps, which I think is definitely true. But there are tools like Stark that help product designers, uh, you know, move up a little more in, in their skill and at least how they approach accessibility. So I'm really excited for this tool. It does a whole bunch of stuff. Um, it doesn't just do color contrast, which is what a lot of product designers think accessibility is, but it does things like focus order, screen reader support, alt text. Um, so, you know, it covers a bunch of different tasks that you have as a product designer when it comes to accessibility. And I, I think this will really help us uh, move further in this field a little. Yeah, and I, and I do think it's really important for designers to learn that accessibility is much more than color contrast. Like you were saying, Jordan, there's so many um, other parts and pieces to it. If you haven't tried yourself um, trying to navigate a website, even just using your keyboard only, is bound to be a frustrating experience and on a lot of different websites. And then downloading um, a screen reader as like a Chrome extension or using the one built into your operating system, um, it is really hard to do. And building a website the right way that makes it easy to traverse using those methods um, is, is not a simple task. And so these tools that help expose some of these concepts to designers, but also help you hand that off as part of your design work, right? Not just saying this is how it should look and feel, but also here are the other mechanisms we need to really make this a great experience. Um, I, I really think that's a cool effort and, and really happy to see the things Stark is working on. Yeah, and I think it's totally free, so definitely go check it out. And that's it for our first episode of the Product Design Report. Thanks for joining us today. We'd really love to know what you think. Uh, this is our first episode, our first try, and we'd love to know what other things you'd like to see. So go ahead and, and let us know and we'll be watching. We'll see you next time.